all of us, town dwellers especially, still take good clean water very much for granted. You turn on the tap and out it comes, or at least usually. But it has to come from somewhere. In Bristol's case, a lot of it now comes from a vast lake 15 kilometres away, called Chew. Chew, with its broken shoreline and wooded island, looks as wild and natural as anything you'll find in the British Isles. Until 1956, all this was farmland, growing rich crops and fat cattle. But Bristol needed more water, lots of it, and so the farmland disappeared. The farmers got their compensation and a great sheet of water spread out across the face of Somerset. Chew Reservoir was created by a number of small hill streams, themselves of little size or consequence, but once the throat of the valley had been strangled with a dam, their effect would be to drown the surrounding countryside. All this rainwater from the Mendip Hills was now caught in a giant drinking cup to appease the growing thirst of Bristol. But would anything or anyone else benefit from the drowning of Chew Valley? Bristol Water was determined that their lake should have as many uses as possible. At dawn on the 1st of April, a year after the reservoir started working, the first beneficiaries arrived. is stocked annually with over 45,000 rainbow and brown trout, which continue to grow on the ample supplies of natural food in the lake. On opening day, the banks were crowded like this. can buy a permit to fish from the bank or from a boat. On average, the fish caught by anglers weigh a little over one kilo, and the record brown trout taken in 1994 scaled a massive five and a half kilos. Hundreds of two to two and a half kilo fish are taken every year. The total catch usually exceeds 20,000 trout. The anglers were by no means the only ones to find the reservoirs had other uses. Along the shallow shores, natural reed beds soon sprang up. Unlike the anglers, the waterfowl didn't wait to be invited. Great crested grebes were one of the first to move in. From January onwards, pairs of grebes perform the complicated ritual of their courtship. Head shaking, the penguin dance. Ornithologists have special names for each stage of the ceremony. It's all been carefully labelled. This stage is known as habit preening. This as the cat display. The reed beds of Chew have become one of the best places to watch the grebe's mirror image mating display. Each ritual movement by one being copied instantly by its partner.
after a performance like that, what is a mere pair of aggressive coots to offer? Common as they are, their early arrival in hundreds at Chu was a fair indication that what had been created as a new supply of tap water was going to become a main attraction for water birds of all kinds. Another early colonist was far from common. The newcomers were the kind of ducks known as stifftails, ruddy ducks from the United States. But they hadn't flown the Atlantic to get here. They'd escaped from the Wildfowl Trust collection at Slimbridge, 50 kilometers away. The ruddy duck's arrival at the lake was of great interest, but soon it began to cause concern about the impact this alien species might have on native fauna. It was enough for the moment to be able to watch the remarkable mating display of the beautiful little drake. To attract the female, he bangs his bright blue bill on his breast, driving air bubbles from his plumage into the water. Wildlife and anglers both got something out of the new lake. Next, it was the general public's turn. People from miles around quickly found that Chu was a pleasant place for a weekend visit. It didn't take the rooks long to take advantage of the situation. They normally feed on farmland, and as their compensation for loss of good arable land, they learned to exact a toll from the visitors. As for the great tit, luckily, a fishery bailiff discovered the nest in time and declared the box out of bounds to anglers. The great crested grebe's nest looks precarious too, but small ripples like this won't flood the nest. This little grebe built her reed nest at more sheltered moorings. The grebes were quick to take advantage of this ideal new habitat, which might have been specially created for them. They turned up in great numbers. At first, they were eyed with suspicion by the anglers, who accused them of taking young trout. For many Chu bird watchers, the high point came when their American visitors, the ruddy ducks, settled down to nest. Ruddy ducks are often what's called nest parasitic. They steal other birds' nests. This one's taken over a moorhens to lay her eggs. Birds' eggs, rare or common, have their inevitable attraction for all kinds of predators. This two-legged species just happened to come in the range of the cameraman's hide when he was filming the ruddy ducks. Even though the nest belonged to a fairly common bird, collecting eggs is illegal. The episode does highlight the fact that sanctuary areas are vital where the public has easy access. At a nature site as rich as Chu, it isn't only the fauna that needs protection, but the flora too. A marsh orchid escapes being crushed by an angler's foot. Flora, fauna and just plain folk, they all have their claims. But how could these claims be resolved? In 1968, dinghy sailors arrived at Chu. The naturalists weren't at all happy. Bristol Water maintained that Chew was for the leisure and pleasure of as many people as possible. So they set up nature reserves from which anglers and sailors would be excluded, such as the vital reedy shoreline of Heriot's End. 
now the grebes could sail in peace with their young while the dinghy sailors got on with it somewhere else. By now, the anglers were more willing to accept the grebes. Research had shown that the great crested grebes and their young feed not on tiny trout, but on unwanted roach fry. Little grebes, usually called dab chicks, are always looked upon with great suspicion by trout fishermen. Anglers claim that they not only swallow up young trout in great numbers, but also vast quantities of trout eggs. A scientist from Bristol University soon established that what they were feeding on here were young coarse fish, which got into the lake from the streams feeding it. Since coarse fish, such as roach and perch, compete with the trout for food, the dab chicks were doing the fishermen a service. It was another example of multiple use of the lake in action and without a head-on clash by interested parties. The one human activity not catered for is swimming. The lake is a water supply, but the ducks, of course, are exempt from the rules. A female coot takes her red-headed family of chicks foraging along the shores of the sanctuary area. Chew is an open, often windy lake, and when a sou'wester blows up in the Bristol Channel, all sorts of foods pile up on the lee shore. The wildfowl know this. The foam this mallard and her brood are bathing in is wind-blown algae. They're sieving the nutrients out of it with the filters in their beaks. Still proudly slapping his chest, the ruddy duck swims off with his mate and brood. Body ducks are not very good performers in the air, but as swimmers and divers, they're among the most accomplished of their kind. Bobbing up again, the drake warns another male to keep off his territory. Already the young have learned the skills of surface diving. The sanctuaries protect land as well as water birds. Before the reserves were created, considerable disturbance to nesting birds came from over-enthusiastic bird watchers. Now, local naturalists act as volunteer wardens to patrol the shoreline and reed beds. A sedge warbler nests in the reed stems at Harriet's end. The reeds have been set aside and left intact for the arrival of spring migrants. The water company has done a great deal of landscaping at Chew. It's planted willows to give shelter for songbirds. This sedge warbler has flown from Africa. The reed bunting is a resident. Both need a waterside nesting place. The warblers feed their young on midges and aquatic flies. The buntings prefer reed seeds. The male reed bunting does his share of feeding the family. The female bunting also feeds the chicks before her mate broods them. Disaster? No, it's just a sedge warbler harmlessly caught in a mist net. Science has its stake in chew, too. Early on in the lake's existence, it became evident that chew was now a key staging post for migrant birds on their journeys through the West Country. So, in 1962, Bristol Water gave permission for local ornithologists to set up their own ringing station.
All the work was done by amateurs, though each ringer has to have an official permit that takes patience and study to obtain. The company set aside land for them and built them a base. Now they ring an average of about 4,000 birds a year, mostly between April and October. Anyone who qualifies and takes on the job has to be prepared to be on duty most weekends, especially at peak migration times. Sedge warblers regularly find their way into the bag. Between 500 and 1,000 are ringed at chew each year. The lightweight ring is put on with a pair of special pliers that won't damage the delicate leg. Next, the bird is put into a tiny canister to be weighed. Sedge warblers have carried chew rings as far as southern Portugal and West Africa. By late summer, the lake level has often fallen enough to lift the curtain on the edge of the valley's past. Here was once an avenue of fine oaks. When autumn strips the leaves along the shore, the winter bird visitors will soon arrive. The trout fisherman season is over. The lake belongs to the wind and the black-headed gulls. When calm returns, the population has dramatically increased with birds seeking shelter from far wider shores. Lesser black-back gulls en route to North Africa. Great crested grebes, hundreds of them, now strip down to somber black and white for winter. Chew Lake has become the most important wintering ground for the species in the whole of England. The wildfowl are in too. Shoveler ducks treat chew as a gigantic soup bowl. They come equipped with their own spoons, outsized bills adapted for filtering plankton and other surface foods. Multiple use of the lake doesn't end with summer. With the nesting season safely passed and the anglers gone home to dream of the great trout they'll catch next season, the sailors can spread themselves over twice their summer area. The wildfowl don't object to dinghies and rarely bother to take wing, even when there's a race on. The north wind blows across the lake and on it a sound is born that has reached Somerset from the furthest north. The Buick swans have come to the end of their long flight from Siberia. They've come nearly 5,000 kilometers to escape a winter that's traditionally one of the worst in the world. Buick swans, named after Thomas Buick, the 18th century naturalist and engraver, are the smaller of our two wild swans. Unlike the semi-tame mute swan, they've got straight pointed beaks and a lovely musical call note. For some, the fishing season at Chew never closes. While the black-headed gull rids the lake of unwanted roach tiddlers, men from the water company's fish hatchery prepare to restock with much sought-after trout. Every season, the fly fishermen catch upwards of 20,000 trout. What comes out must go back. The fishery grows its own replacements. 
In coldest January, the trout are ready to spawn. Their eggs will have a better chance of survival if they're protected in a hatchery. So ripe henfish are netted and stripped of their eggs by hand. Next, the males are milked. The young from these artificial spawnings are reared in stew ponds, where they're liberally fed with protein pellets. They grow at an enormous rate, so that in a year or two, they're ready to go back into the lake. By the opening of the fishing season in late March, they'll be wild, wary and full of fight. A diving duck, a golden eye, shows off its immaculate plumage in the winter sun. The lake shore on a sunny winter's day is an idyllic place. Idyllic for birds like the lapwing. Pleasant too for those who come to watch them from the hides and lookout points built for bird watchers and the general public. There are naturalists who argue that multiple use of a lake doesn't work, that where a chain of such waters exists, and Bristol has several large reservoirs, it's better to give one over to fishing, one to sailing, and keep a third as a nature reserve. The birds of Chew seem to have proved the opposite. They may squabble with each other, but thanks to the zoning of activities, they very rarely find their interests clashing with those of urban man, enjoying his leisure in the open air. Perhaps the best moment of all at Chew is witnessed by very few of the thousands who come here to enjoy themselves. At dusk in winter, gulls, wildfowl and starlings are going home to roost. it hard to realize that all this has happened only because millions of people in Bristol needed an extra glass of nice, clean, cold water. Wildlife tomorrow and the start of a new series. Wings over Britain features birds. Oh, there's a surprise. Starting with the cuckoo.